exciting things, dates coming up. This is my dog, Lil. She has a bumblebee for Halloween. She's very angry about it since they're about to spot out. Uh, I know, she's really... I almost put the one where you could tell she was like, I hate my life. And I was like, that's a lie. Uh, but, what was I saying? Oh, next Friday is the last day to withdraw from any course for any, anywhere. When do you think about calculating your standing in this course throughout the semester? One, you can assume that all of your exam scores are going to be pretty similar to what they have been if they are consistent. If you have an off day, or have drastically changed your behavior and you're like, I think I'm more likely to get this new population of grades. Um, for example, if you made a 100 on the first one and then promptly went on to score 25s on everything else, I would assume that your score will be somewhere between those for everything else. The, there is another mini exam that will be dropped that's just not set up in Canvas until after mini exam five. Other things. November 15th, which is two weeks away on, on a Monday, is mini exam five. On December 1st, which is the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, we have mini exam six as well as Kim and Life will be due. I feel like there's some, oh, for Thanksgiving week, we have class on that Monday, just in case you were like, oh, there's no school. I will be here. You will have the award-winning Photography from here that may or may not show the whole board, hard to say. Um, so I would recommend coming. So there's that. There's no class on Wednesday of Thanksgiving week. I think for anyone, but definitely not for this class. It's 4.30. Like, we should all be at home thinking about making turkey. Um, questions, comments, concerns, anything else? I updated the Alex objectives earlier. Unless something changes, I will verify that when we get back to my, when I get back to my office. But I think they're set up to where I think we're going to go. So basically, a bunch moved out. The titles of those are wildly irrelevant. So I made a guess in August, and I was very wrong. And so, in light of changing those, just go with the due dates. You have them due every Monday. I think it says like chapter seven and eight. That we're clearly in six and seven. I'm sorry for the confusion. We're just going to roll with it. We will finish everything, I think, by the end of the semester. So any other questions, comments, concerns, issues, choices? I like the picture. I know. She's so cute. I was looking at photos for something else. And I was like, I should show my students because who doesn't need dog life? Today we will, <clears throat> I don't want to say not need a calculator, but you will definitely need a periodic table. So if you could grab that, if it's not already out, we're going to think about, we'll end today with periodic trends. We are going to start with electron configuration and orbitals. last time we're going to draw this like electron line configuration on the board. But at the end of class on Wednesday, right before the mini exam, uh, we were thinking about how do we fill orbitals. And so this here is the Bohr hypothesis or the Bohr structure that says electrons can live in discrete orbitals. They are X number of distance away from the nucleus. Yes. I'm going to write all over the board. The uh, internet people are going, we just need the whole board. They're just going to have to. If you don't come to class, it's a hard life for you. My philosophy today. Otherwise, I should bring like an influencer light and set it up in the middle and have it track me, but I can't quite figure out how to purchase one of those and make it work every time. So, this is the basically the Bohr hypothesis where they are in discrete levels. 
So as we continued, we learned about Schrodinger and different wave functions. And so when we calculate the wave functions, what we realized that as soon as you have more than one electron, pretty much everybody but hydrogen, we start to see this splitting phenomenon where the 1s is down here by itself, doesn't really change from n equals 1, but the 2s and the 2p are not at the same energy. And they are kind of average above the n equals 2 line. For the 3s, 3p, and then the 3d, we start to see this. The question becomes, when we get to 4s, You fill them as you reach them, as you move up, until the 4s is slightly below in energy than the 3d. So this is why when we draw this, fill them in diagonal rows, we fill the 3D 4P 5S, and we start to see them fill no longer in N equals shell order. So the reasons for that are due to what's called orbital splitting, where they basically are at slightly different energetic levels because of how they are structured and how far they are from the nucleus. So, this information, combined with this information, gives you a lot of info about where the electron's going to be. So on Monday, we drew up some of the, I don't know, I'll call them low-level elements, but the light elements, and said, where are they for oxygen? Or for bromine? Mm, we didn't talk about bromine. But if we start to ask about things lower in the periodic table, heavy elements, we want to make sure we're filling them in the right order. So think on Monday I drew did I draw this on the board on Monday? Where I thought we were. Where we have helium and hydrogen in the n equals 1, n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, as you go down. So here we have our s orbitals. And then we have our p orbitals here, and d orbitals, and f orbitals. The important fact, or the thing that we need to remember about the d orbitals, is that they are offset. So, the first row of the d orbitals is actually the n equals 3, d electrons. And then it's 3, 4, 5, and 6, whereas the 7s is prior to the 6d. And that's true in all of these. The f orbitals are n equals 4 and n equals 5, respectively. This is due to the changing L values. So if you think back to quantum numbers, for every n shell, you get an increasing number of L orbitals. And so it turns out that Mathematically and structurally, the first row of the d orbitals are part of the n equals 3 shell, even though the n equals 4 s orbital is filled prior to that. What questions do we have thus far? We're going to do several examples, so this will all, I will say, percolate together, but percolate together. So let's think about chromium. Did we look at chromium on Monday? Thank you. So if we have chromium, chromium has 24 electrons. And so there's a couple of ways that you can look at chromium and say, how can I figure out the electronic structure? One, you can memorize and draw out all the orbitals and then plop in 24 electrons and do that. That is valid. I support that hypothesis. Alternatively, 
you can memorize the orders and look at your periodic table and say, I, chromium is here in the D block, means we have D electrons. We know that it is the first row, therefore that has to be 3D. So we only need to draw out the orbital until we achieve the 3D electrons. So we have the 1S, 2S, 2P, 3S, 3P, 4S, and 3D. Now we take our 24 electrons and drop them in following both the Hund's rule and the Pauli exclusion principle. Hund's rule tells us that degenerate orbitals fill one at a time until all are equivalent, and then we go back and fill them in. The Pauli exclusion principle tells us that you have one up and one down. So from here, we have these 18. And so if you follow Hund's rule, you get to this, where there are two electrons in the S and three electrons in the D. However, chromium is an exception. And the reason chromium is an exception is because the 4S and the 3D orbitals are like this, energetically. And they move back and forth. And it turns out that it is more energetically stable to promote the one electron in the 4S into the empty 3D to give you six equivalent orbitals as opposed to one filled orbital, four half filled, and an empty orbital. Questions? Yeah? Uh, no. All the exceptions, are, the exceptions follow patterns, and they're all going to follow this pattern. So the Y is, so if we look at this graphic, and the 4S and the 3D are slightly close in energy. When you fill an orbital, it gets lower in energy. Basically, it becomes more stable. It turns out that filling the 4S and then the 3D having four orbitals that are half filled and one that is empty is kind of wobbly, perspective wise. If you can make these six all have one electron, it is more stable. And it does that by promoting, basically saying, you only get one, and that guy gets half. And so when we look at the exceptions, what we're going to see, they're highlighted in pink in this graphic, is that chromium and molybdenum, which are on top of one another, have the same different. They both follow this pattern because they both have the same ability to promote one out to make six identical orbitals. So, what? Well, there's six identical, the 4S and the 5Ds. So, chromium and molybdenum follow this trend. If we were to look at copper... which has 29 electrons. So for copper, I'm going to use the noble gas configuration for ease of use instead of writing the same thing twice. So we have argon, 4s, and 3ds. So if we follow Hund's rules, it tells us the 3d is filled, and we end up with this where the 4S is fully filled and the 3D is missing one electron. It is preferential to take an electron out of the 4S and put it into the 3D. Because when the 3D is filled, it falls below the, it falls deeper into the core, allowing the S orbital to remain as a valence orbital. So what we see is copper and silver have the same phenomenon. Elements such as ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, which are basically 44 through 46, 
either steal one or two electrons from the s orbital to put them into the d orbital. All of these are due to the same phenomenon, that these orbitals are so close in physical space that it is more energetically favorable to have more electrons in the d orbital, or to make them all fully filled or half filled, depending on where you are. What questions do we have about d orbital rule breakers? Yeah, so each of these orbitals is further and further out. But they are, whether it's in physical distance or energetic distance, what I'm saying is they are... And so the thing with electrons are always going to be on the exterior. Yes. The valence electrons are the outer electrons. Everything else is part of the core. And so we'll talk more about valence electrons... I think starting on Monday, if not Monday of next week, then Wednesday of next week. Yeah. Um, so in that talk question, so the full answer is actually going to be your valence is affecting more or less than the nucleus. Yes. Energy. Typically, we don't. What we will learn next week is that we don't tend to think about valence electrons in metals okay. because they don't form bonds the way that I won't say normal elements do. Um, when we start talking about that, typically valence is composed of the S and the P. D elements, those are the no rules kids for a lot of things, and that's going to be true for this as well. Yeah? So for the elements that are in the X blocks, are they going to be doing the same thing where they steal specifically from S to put into D, or are they going to do something different with S blocks or something? Yes. Yeah. But we haven't talked about those, so we'll talk about that in just like 10 seconds. Uh, so would it be a good way to look at, like, from like an analogy standpoint, would it be like, instead of like, like on the school bus, like we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. instead of like shoving like three kids through the seat, it'd be better to put like at least two there and like the third one kind of like holding a spot with like another person? Kind of. It's basically saying that inst if there are six seats, Sometimes we want the first two to sit in the first one, and then you would have four with one empty. So it's better to have one in all six, even if they're not all the same seat. The bus analogy kind of starts to collapse when we get too dark, deep dark into this. But overall, what we see is that in the case of the 4S and a half-filled 3D, and the 4S, and they could be fully filled 3D, and that's true in both the 3D and the 4D, but you'll note in the 5D there are no exceptions. Turns out those are so far from the nucleus, they all follow the rules. But these are energetically more favorable, substantially enough that we do not find 2S orbitals and 4D orbital, 4D electrons ever. It will always take what where we would have put the one in the S and move it in, but it only does that when you get to the the fourth one. So it doesn't do that prior to that. And so, yeah. Uh, so you said that if you steal one or two electrons from the S orbital, would you just write that as a big, big two? Would you just write it as an empty or S and then full or whatever? The yes. Is? You could. So the question is if it steals it, how do you annotate that if we're looking at palladium? So palladium is the only one that rips both out of the S orbitals. So for palladium, which is PD, and palladium has 46 electrons, so it is krypton, 5S, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the 4D. And so in that case, it would just have all 10 of its electrons here. And if you drew it, and you didn't include the 5S, that would be acceptable. If you have the 5S and you left it empty, also acceptable. If you write the uh, electron configuration for palladium, it would be krypton 4010. You could also have 5S0, you are not required to, 
Um, I know there are some people who require them to be in specific places. I'm not one of those people. No promises about Alex, though. Why does Nickel also do that? So Nickel doesn't because they are too close to the nucleus. So there is a big difference. When you go from n equals 4 to n equals 5, in how close those two are together. Okay. And so some of you see in the 4D, there is a lot more movement of those electrons that is not observed in the 3D. Which is why ruthenium, rhodium, and palladium, you find them in a lot of catalysis reactions because their electrons are a little bit more mobile. So you see those in semiconductors and other things where you dope them with certain metals because you can change the energetics using those as well. Other questions? Yes? So um, with the electrons, is it more um, energy favorable if they're closer to the nucleus or further away from the nucleus? It depends on what it is. Like they're just, every element is set up slightly different and in some elements, the further you get, the more mixing you have because there's less structure. The closer you get, the more structure there is because they are very defined. When we think about the n equals 1, 2 to 3, there's enough space for all of those things to be distinct. So let's talk about the lanthanide and the actinide series. Both lanthanum and actinium, which are 57 and 89 respectively, are they start moving things around as well. Those for the ones in the F block, you should know that they are unique. Alex can ask you about them. I will not ask them, ask you about them on an exam because they break rules in a non-patterned way. In my opinion, the rule breaking or the non-rule following events that happen in the D orbital makes sense. They are patterned, they all do the same thing. We don't see that in the F orbitals. You should know that they are rule breakers, but I will not ask you about those on an exam or many, a, let's just say a graded assessment. Questions? Let's look at some examples. Before I do that, yeah. This is sort of like a semi-related, not really important. Is the ability to sort of like break these rules and hand off electrons relevant in the transfer of electricity in general? Is that why maybe the D-block one <coughs> I don't know the answer to that. I, like, I know that the energetics of those allow them. So when we think about some of these and we start to see oxidation numbers that are substantially divergent, so we know that calcium always has an oxidation number of plus two, right? So part of the reason the ones in the D block can change that is due to how they can change the structures of their electrons and which electrons can come out. And we'll talk about electron configuration of ions next week. And so some of it is that. As to why they're used in different things, I think some of it has to do with their ability to conduct electricity, because not everything does. And so some of that is probably all interrelated, but that's way outside the scope of what I personally know about. They can tell you lots of cool things about what they do in biological systems, but outside of that. So D block elements do not create the type of bonds that we're going to talk about this semester. D block elements do weird, not weird things, but their properties are different. I was just wondering about how we would, you know, discuss how, like, say you're talking about, I don't know, lead, you could write, um, like, two or three or whatever next to it to indicate what bonds it signs and basic charge is. And I was just asking if that is because of, you know, where the balance electrons are sitting. Well, so lead two and lead three have lost electrons, right? So in order to be lead two, it doesn't, it is not in its neutral state. So that is a statement. Leads doesn't have valence electrons the same way as other things. And what I mean is lead has no valence electrons in the way that we are gonna talk about bonding formation 
in this class. When we think about lead, because it is different, and different doesn't mean bad, where usually sometimes we say, oh, it's different, and that's not a good thing. So the ability of lead or other D block elements to create their bonds is set up in similar ways, but if that really jazzes you up, inorganic chemistry goes into that in fascinating detail because they, are, they create bonds in different arrangements and they create broader electronic structures that are likely relevant to why they can and cannot conduct electricity. It's a long answer. Anyone need to take a photo of them before I erase it? Excellent. We will leave up all of this for our learning purposes. So our first element of the day is calcium. Now, the first thing I do is one, figure out where calcium is on my periodic table. Because calcium is in the n equals four row, right? So we just count down four rows. It's an s block element. That means we need every orbital prior to the 4s. So for calcium, that contains 20 electrons. We have the 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, and then the 4s. We're going to plop in our 20 electrons, following all of the previous rules. And so we have the 1s that's fully filled. All of these are fully filled. You do not need to show orbitals that are not being used. So this, when it says to draw them, it should look like this. When it says to write them, it gives you the 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Where these tell us the 4s orbital only has two electrons. And so you can use both of that and both of those data points in order to figure that out. What questions do we have about the electronic configuration of calcium? Um, I'm, what would it say if you can use the, the, like the, the noble gas? Yeah, that's what I'm on 4s. It would say draw the electron configuration for element. And then in parentheses, it would say you can or you cannot. So because I agree that just do this implies that you could do it anyway, like for a written graded assessment from me, I will be specific. So if you use, if you always write out the long way, you'll always get full credit. If you use the noble gas to kind of shortcut, you will get less credit because I wanted to know if you knew where all the other ones were. Other question? So there are three additional examples. We have chlorine, molybdenum, and lead. This is element 82, not element 46, which is palladium. Just as an aside. So, why don't you guys work on those? When you have questions, you can raise your hand and I will come and assist. <coughs> do the long way for chlorine and molybdenum. You can do the short way or the shorter way for lead. <coughs> 
Thank you. 
just erased, to basically say, okay, where is it? We know that if it's in the second row over here, it's in the 3p orbital. So I'm going to go ahead and write, draw out 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. Now from here, you're going to just start filling them in. There are 17 electrons. Everybody's got to have a house. When you get to the p orbitals, you should follow Hun's rule. For this, there is a single, one of your three p orbitals only has one electron. Now, it could have been any of those three orbitals. It could be the first one, it could be the middle one, or it could be the last one. They are all indistinguishable pretty much permanently. So in this case, when you get the noble gas configuration, students are often confused about, well, how do I know how many p electrons there are? Because you start changing different things. So in the p block over here, there are six elements, right? As you count across p1, p2, p3, 4, 5, and 6. So because chlorine is the fifth element over, there will be five electrons in that p orbital. Question. What questions do we have thus far? So you would write this 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. So up next, we have molybdenum, which lives in the 4d, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, whoa, that's in the wrong order, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4p. So now we have 42 electrons that all need to find their homes. And you make sure that you fill according to all of the rules. and a half days later, we end up with the 5s and the 4d, and there are six electrons and six orbitals. So molybdenum follows the same violation that chromium does, and it promotes one out of the 5s into the 4d to where you have six equivalent orbitals. Questions? We can write this. 1s2, 2s2, 2 Now, let's look at lead. Lead will take you 1 billion years. So go ahead and write or draw. Yeah. Thank you. Any other typographical error? I don't think so. So lead. The thing with these is the numerical values have to be accounted for in order. So when you go from cesium to barium, you're going to run through the first row of, row of this lanthanide series before picking back up with hafnium and going across to lead. 
So you'll have to account for those as well. Using the Neville gas configuration of xenon, we have the 6s2, 4f14, the 5d10, and the 6p2. So if we write these out, They look a lot like this. And I'm certain that your hands hurt the same amount as mine. It is important that for the p orbitals, you show that there are three equivalent, even though we don't use all three of them. You don't need to show the after that 7s, but you do need to show all of the p or d orbitals that are being utilized. What other questions do we have, if you have any, about electron configuration? Please make sure on the mini exam you read what it's asking for. It will more than likely only ask for one of the two. Please write this, please draw that. Use the noble gas, don't use the noble gas, et cetera, et cetera. Any other questions? Yeah. So if you look at the atomic numbers, so you see how the atomic number for cesium is 55, then 56, then there's a gap. So you fill them in the order that you see them, and you have to account for all numbers. So that's how you can remember that you have to pop down. You can take a detour through the F block before coming back in. Are you asking about the speed at which yeah. they turn? Or is that no, so it turns out you can either know where they are or how fast they're going. It's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so the answer to that is the electrons, we didn't talk a lot about it, but their orbits are quite fluid. And so a 3s electron could be close to the nucleus or far out where we think of the n equals 3. It just has a greater probability of being at the n equals three value. And so the electrons themselves all move, I think, at roughly the same speeds. They just kind of, they move around in a distinct specific orbit. If you're trying to draw a picture in your brain of the 1s, then the 2s, and the 2p, it feels like there would be significant traffic jams in there but there aren't. How those all work is well outside the scope of Jenkins. Life. Other questions? So for the remainder, we're going to talk about chapter seven, periodic trends. But before I do that, I'm going to erase the board. Does anyone need any of this information before I go to town with the eraser? Gotcha. Just want to make sure. So periodic trends. are an interesting, I don't want to call it a phenomenon, but in this case, we're going to set this up. There are three groups, so we're going to talk about nuclear charge, or the effective charge, size, distribution, that will start on Monday, and then ionization energy and electron affinity will be the last. Periodic trends, we've moved away from using our calculators, right? So students often get very rightfully concerned about like where are we going to see this or what's it going to look like on an exam or a mini exam or something else. So at the end are some example problems. There are some buried within this. But periodic trend questions are less numerical and more 
rank the following or determine which of these has the greatest or the least. So effective nuclear charge is the one that we're going to think about the most. So the effective nuclear charge is based on the periodic table. But first, where did this periodic table come from? So the periodic table, I have had one hanging on the wall in either my home or my office for since I graduated from college. Now, that makes me feel like I have poor decorating space, but I do mean next to my computer where I work, not like in my living room with like, oh yes, don't you wanna see my periodic table? That's excessive. But the periodic table is essential. And the reality is the periodic table that you guys have has limited data. There are periodic tables with way more information in there. And then there are periodic tables that are a little bit more kitschy, you know, the periodic table of shots or of desserts or animals or snacks, all kinds of things. But the reality is it is an organizational table and it feels like things are organized based on increasing numerical or increasing number of electrons slash protons, which is true. That is how they're organized. So the reality is one thing at the end of chapter six, you might have started to process is that when we look at elements in a column, they're all gonna have the same electron configuration. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tel tel uranium, polonium, and livermorium all have four P electrons, all of them, because they're all in the same place. It turns out that the organization also tells us about their properties. So in biological systems, oxygen and sulfur can replace each other in certain systems. Not always, sometimes it doesn't work, but you can for a lot of things. So in 1871, Mendeleev published this graphic that is shown on the right side of the slide. So that was his development of the periodic table. Now, his is a little bit more table and a little bit less like this. But buried in his table, he has rows and columns that directly correspond to what we see in this periodic table. The more interesting part is that he predicted that there were elements that we had not yet found. And he was really, really on point with what their masses would be, what their electronics would look like, and other things. And he was able to do that based on the arrangement of the periodic table. So in his... There are, some of these you can see dashes. That's where he would say like, oh, yeah, we're gonna fill that part out later. You know, like when you write over paper and you say blah, 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 where you need to add like a specific statement. If you don't do that, I recommend it. That's what I do. Or I say, add something about something here. Make sure you highlight it so you don't turn it in with weird statements. But that's how we hold placeholders in the terms of the periodic table. And so this periodic table, that image is from the Mendeleev paper. At the same time, there were sci a scientist named Meyer who was doing similar research. And he also, his was slightly different. The combination of the two leads to our traditional arrangement with the S, the P, and the, the S, the D, and the P block, as well as the F block elements. So this periodic table, so for the next sections, what we're going to talk about is using this to predict and or analyze how different elements will behave or function in relation to one another. So the first thing we're gonna think about is the effect of nuclear charge. So nuclear charge is how many protons are stuck in the center of any given element. So for any element on the periodic table, you should be able to tell me what their nuclear charge is. It is the number of protons as a positive charge. And so if we think about sodium, it has a plus 11 charge. If we think about its last electron, which is in the 3s orbital, what we will know is does it feel or sense all 11 protons, or is it shielded in some way by the n equals 1 shell and the n equals 2 shell? And so the question with the effective 
which I think Alex may call it Z-star, or you may have heard it called Z-star in another course. Those are the same thing. It's basically just some scientists call it Z-effective, some scientists call it Z-star. Most of the time at UNF, we'll call it Z-effective. So the question that Z-effective is attempting to address is how much of any given positive charge does this electron set? So Z effective is determined by, or Z effective is altered by the size of the nucleus and the distance from the nucleus. So this class, you guys are quite spread out. Most of you are relatively near someone. May or may not be adjacent to them. When we think about effective nuclear charge, you can think about either someone holding a flashlight and how far does that light propagate. But the other way I like to think about it is what about if I had a bag of fresh baked cookies? If you are quite next to me, you can tell that I'm having chocolate chip cookies. In the back of the room, you're going to start to be like, something, is someone having a cookie? Or maybe Chick-fil-A works better. Either way. But we know that scent travels. And it matters how close you are to the person who has Chick-fil-A or chocolate chip cookies. If we were to all stand in a single file line, the distance between you in the back and me up front, there would be a lot of people between you. But if we spread out in rings, you might be closer, but there might be more people between you, and the spatial distance is going to change. So the effective nuclear charge can be based on the Coulomb's electrostatic equation, where k, which is a constant, q1, q2, divided by the distance. So we can see that the distance apart matters, but also the change in charge upon the nucleus. So typically, we have thought, and we'll continue to think about Coulomb's law, with one proton and one electron in the distance. But for sodium, it is one electron and 11 protons. So it matters how far apart they are. And so as the two charges move further and further apart, they are going to effectively sense each other less and less. So the effective nuclear charge gets less as you move away. So the effective nuclear charge can be calculated. It is equal to the nuclear charge, aka the atomic number. So for any element, you should be immediately able to calculate Z. You look at the periodic table and you say, oh, hey, it's whatever the atomic number is. But it's minus S. And S is the shielding coefficient. So it matters the arrangement of the electrons between the nucleus and the electron of interest. For sodium, we have a plus 11 center. This electron out here is shielded by a fully filled n equals 1 shell and a fully filled n equals 2 shell. So this gets some level of shielding. Now we can think about the effective nuclear charge based on the shielding coefficient. Shielding coefficients can be calculated. You can use Slater's rules or any of the other rules. They give you slightly different values, but mostly the same. Slater's rules is a series of prompts based on the electron configuration. How many fully filled shells, how many fully filled orbitals versus suborbitals. It is a complex calculation where you kind of plug all the things in and Z minus S gives you a value. We're not going to be calculating that a lot, but this is more of a presentation of how you could. 
So one way that you can think about C effective is, is it just one? You add one electron every time, so the 11th electron is shielded by the 10 electrons between it. It turns out that that value is closer to like two and three because there's this whole range of motion among these values. So the reason that it is not 11 or 10 is because these electrons are mobile and they're not all in a row. It's not the nucleus, 10 electrons, and then the electron of interest. In fact, when we start to plot or think about the effective as a global trend, the value for Z effective, if you plot it, it with atomic number and Z effective, it looks a little bit more like this. Where as you look at your periodic table, the effective increases as you go across, and it slightly increases as you go down. Now, as we start to think about this, the question is, why does it increase as you go across? Across, it Z increases, or Z effective increases, due to increasing Z. As you go across, the shielding doesn't change all that much because you're adding to the outer layer. But the nuclear charge continues to get bigger. So Z effective increases as you go across. The reason it only slightly increases as you go down due to changes in N and X, where N is the principal quantum number or the row, and S is the shielding. You get better shielding by a completely filled orbital, or a completely filled N shell. So it increases as you go across, and it in slightly increases as you go down. What questions do we have at this juncture? All the protons in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. So in Alex, it's going to ask you a couple of different things. It's going to ask you about a specific location. So sometimes it'll say like in the 2s is the shielding greater or less? It's going to be a lot of those table things that you guys really dislike. Which of these elements, oxygen or lead? But it'll ask about the same electron, the 2s, which is an outer electron in oxygen, but in lead, it's deep in the core. And so the difference is actually due to this change in the nuclear charge. Because the distance is the same, but it turns out for oxygen, it's eight, some shielding. For lead, it's 82. So it is just a substantially greater nuclear charge, which wildly increases the Z effective for N equals two electrons compared to the other. This trend and this trend are for the outermost electron. When you start, the same trends are true for n equals two, but it alters slightly when we think about the changes based on everything else. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, the right, so you go across a row, and then you have to go to the next row. When it does that, it only slightly increases between lithium and sodium. 
So if you look at the atomic numbers, 10 is neon and 11 is sodium. So basically, as you go across, it goes up, 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 and then it has to go all the way back down to reset, essentially, due to the fact that you've gone to a new in shell, which is further out, so you are better shielded by the completely filled shell before that. So one of the ways that you can be asked about this on an exam is to rank the series of elements. So with atomic trend, it's basically, which of these is greatest? Which of these is smallest? Explain the trend. Give the trend. Answer these questions about them. So in this case, we want to rank from highest to lowest, <coughs> potassium, krypton, cobalt, rubidium, and selenium. Make sure that your greater than, less than signs point in the direction you mean them to go. The bigger value has the larger amount moving forward. Cookie Monster wants to eat more cookies than the other one. You will think that's hilarious, but you're going to use it on the exam when you want to make sure you're going the right way. Maybe I'm the only one who has to think about that all the time. So the question is always, if I give you two elements, it's, I don't want to say easy, but it's easier to say which one is to the right or the left or where is it. We have five elements. So how on earth do we take this mess of five elements and figure out where to start? One, figure out where they all are on the periodic table. Don't try to answer the question, just figure out where they are. When you look at your periodic table, it turns out that potassium Krypton, cobalt, and selenium are all in the same row. So we can pretty easily figure out in that row alone what the ranking of those should be. We know that Z effective increases as we go all the way across. So the largest Z effective should be krypton because krypton is all the way to the right. We know that potassium is all the way to the left. That means it has to be the smallest. So we've now achieved 40% correctness, and we can now look at the others. So the question becomes, which is going to be greater, cobalt or rubidium? We know, because cobalt and then selenium are in order as we go across, that cobalt and then you would choose selenium. So we know that more than likely selenium is greater than cobalt. The question becomes, where does rubidium fit in this? But rubidium is just below potassium. So we know that that's just a slight increase versus the real increase as you go across. So it would be potassium, rubidium, cobalt, selenium. It is equally correct for you to basically fully flip this and have krypton, selenium, cobalt, rubidium, potassium. I just happen to like big things on the right because that's how I personally think about it. Both would be acceptable. With periodic trends, it is difficult to assess the trend if your values or your elements are not localized in a single place in a row, or a column, or a region. You cannot use this as a dartboard. Well, I can't do darts at all. But if you could, and pick any five elements and then try to ask where does the trend go. Because it turns out that when you start to compare something here, and here, here, and there, the trends start to, they don't collapse, but the, at what point, does this slight increase overtake the across the row increase? Virtually impossible to tell. So I will ask you about things in rows or in columns, or some rows and columns where the trend is easily identifiable. I know it feels like I often set out to trap you, but that's not typically true, and it will not be true here in that either. What questions do we have about the effective and or Electron configurations. 
uh, ionization energy is related to Z effective. So we spend the most time on Z effective because in my personal opinion, everything is related to Z effective. So if you can understand why Z effective changes, the atomic size will make sense as well as ionization energy and electron density. Other questions? So if you were to give us like a bomb example, basically the one that's like, that's like at the bottom would be the highest one. Mm -hmm. Typically, we think about it, so when it's asked for the trend, it's the last electron added, the outermost electron, is the one that we think about it. Alex will ask you about which has a greater Z effective, the 2S in oxygen or the 2S in something else. And that, is, that changes based on the nuclear charge. But those two things are combined into the same like philosophy. Other questions? Not usually, no. If you do, it would be like, re, like if you read the calculation, it will tell you what to do. You do not need to memorize how to do it. I have asked in years in the past. I don't intend to ask about it this year. But people always seem to see old stuff and then be like, where did this come from? I have asked, yes. It's a good question. So it turns out that when you, if we think about the rows in the classroom, so when you move from, like let's say you move to the row behind you, you're not, you're now shielded by all of the rows in front of you. And so when you go from that same row to the next row, it is a big change in the shielding. And that is the biggest difference. So you are right that the new, the Z charge has changed. But when you go from, we have a positive nucleus. Once these are fully filled, you get a better shielding here, which makes the effective go back down. And then you start over again. We are here. So usually I don't talk about cookies. I talk about dog food. But I didn't really want to do this on the internet because this is going to live forever. However, if someone up here, myself, stepped in dog poop, no matter how many people are in the same row with you, you are the same distance. And they're not shielding you from the aroma at all. If you move to the next row and that row is full, you are more shielded from the aroma that doesn't change. And even if that a little stinchier, you are more shielded due to the completeness of the people in front of you. And that is the difference when you go down versus going across. Any other questions? Is that a comment or a question? Um, I still have a comment, but I also want to ask a question. So then thinking about this um, conceptually, a Like an incomplete yeah, orbital? So like if you had like, say, I don't know, um, three heat groups, that would be pretty irrelevant in terms of the shielding effect, but you wouldn't account for that. So that's in Slater's rules, which is the most common way to calculate the shielding coefficient. Those still provide some shielding but it is not to the same degree as the fully filled 3S versus the 3P. So they are not ineffective, but they are not, they don't contribute a lot 
but they are there and they dampen the effect of the nuclear charge. All of those are true statements. Right. I, I only wanted to say that because it helped me personally conceptualize the, um, the, the, nuclear, or the effect of the nuclear charge. I thought that other people might benefit from hearing as well. Yeah. Excellent. I think other people did. But. Those are elements that have less of an effect on the In the calculation. It has to do with the charge charge both attraction and repulsion between electrons in the same orbital. So the 3px and the 3py, while they are 90 degrees from one another, can interact in such a way that they can't, they do in fact shield one another to some degree. And it has to do with the fact, so we didn't talk about the radial probability. So it turns out that electrons in the 5s have a slight probability of being near the nucleus. It's lower probability, but the probability increases as you move out due to the radial probability density. So you could find a 5s electron in the nucleus, you could find it in the 1s, in the 2s, in the 3s, in the 4s, but mostly you find it in the 5s. So the probability of an electron being in the nucleus increases as you move out? No. The ability of the electron to be in the 5s, it's a radial probability, so it increases as you go through the different shells with different nodes. And so all of those tell you about where the electron is, which is how you can get shielding from a same orbital electron. 